Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life, John 6, 68. Thank you for joining us at Fletcher's Chapel this morning as we worship God together, beginning with the call to worship as found in your bulletin. Sing God's praise. Give thanks to the Lord above. Seek the Lord and trust God's strength. Proclaim God's wonderful works. Live in the spirit of love and grace. Give thanks for Christ's marvelous love. Please join in singing I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord, hymn number 19th at 5 o'clock. All women, uh, whether you've been attending these meetings or not, whether you are planning to attend in the future or, or not, are welcome to join in this, this uh, meeting, especially as we are planning this meal. And if you would like to volunteer for something, please let Tina know. 
Are there other in announcements we need to be sure to lift up this morning? Yes, Dave. Those that have not given me the papers with the update to the directory, I'd like to get them by August 31st. I sent out a letter to those we haven't seen for a while or haven't last couple of weeks or so, just to be sure everybody knew about it. Uh, and that's the deadline I gave them, so hopefully we'll get something out in September. Great. So by August 31st, if you've not already given her your updated information, confirmed what is already in there, uh, preferably given it to us on the new form, uh, please see Debbie and uh, so we can get that updated and have air, all those changes made by August 31st. And please don't assume that I know if you moved or something. <laughs> don't make any assumptions. Don't make oh, any okay. assumptions. <laughs> Even if you've been in the same house for 20 years, don't make assumptions. Thank you. Any other announcements? Then please join me in a moment of prayer. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you are saying to us today. Amen. Please join in our Psalter reading. It can be found in the very back of your hymnal on page 828. We will read the psalm responsibly, verses 1 through 11 of Psalm 105. And we will also, wherever you see the strange colored R, we will read the response that is printed above. Will you please stand in body or in spirit? <coughs> They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name, make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to the Lord, sing praises, tell all God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek the Lord's presence continually. Remember the wonderful works God has done, the miracles and judgments God has uttered. The of Abraham, God's servants, children of Jacob, God's chosen ones. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. <coughs> Excuse me. The Lord is our God whose judgments are in all the earth. The Lord is mindful of his everlasting covenant of the Lord commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant made with Abraham, his son sworn to Isaac and confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for his inheritance. They who wait for the Lord shall be their strength. You may be seated. And, uh, G.D. Bass is going to come forward and read our Old Testament and New Testament lessons for us this morning. And she's wearing her Bible school t-shirt. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. This morning our Old Testament can be found in, um, in Genesis chapter 29, verses 15 through 28. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 44. This is one of my favorite Bible stories, so I'm going to go slow. <laughs> Laban said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I will work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but that's, they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to lie with her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. And then, when the, but when the evening came, he took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob. And Jacob lay with her. 
And Laban set, gave his servant girl Sel Silva to his daughter as a, as a her maid servant. When morning came, there was Leah. Ja so Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not our <coughs> custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and Laban gave him his, his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Our epistle lesson can be found on, in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, page 1702. And in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit itself intercedes with intercedes for us with groans and words cannot express. And it can and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God's work, God works for up the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be comfort, conformed to the likeness of his son, and he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those who predestined, he also called those he called, he, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. When, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for, up for all of us, how will he not have also, among, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who he, is he that condemns? Christ who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and it is, is also interceding for us. Those who separate us from the love of Christ, sh who shall, sorry, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered to, as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will, we, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks to, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand and join in singing our metal hymn number 405, Seek Ye First.
this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 31 through 33, verses 44 through 52. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, it is found on page 1471. Uh, recently in worship, we have been reading other verses from this chapter, this chapter of Matthew, and the one, uh, some of the verses preceding it, are talking uh, with Jesus about talking to his disciples and others about what is the kingdom of God like. What is the kingdom of God like? In some cases, they may have been phrasing it as, what is heaven? But Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of heaven can be here on earth if we live right. But he uses a series of parables to help them to understand something that's beyond our understanding, something that really, until we see it, till we are there, we don't know what it looks like. And he's trying to help them to understand uh, this huge concept with these small little paragraphs, small little stories, these very relatable items that he's talking about. So here are the words uh, recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. The first is the parables of mustard seed and the yeast. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the large, largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. And then the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like the treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. In the parable of the net, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it upon the shore. And then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. And he said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. Our sermon this morning will begin with a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, take the prayers of our hearts and the prayers of our minds and the prayers of our mouths and meld them together with your spirit. And let us be prayer working in the world around us, the answer to other people's prayers. As we hear the scriptures afresh this morning, let us take into the world what we have learned and help others to experience the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Have you ever noticed how hard we can make things for ourselves? Have you ever done anything that deliberately, intentionally made life harder? Maybe not even intentionally, maybe accidentally, but you made life harder or more complicated than it needed to be. Are you like me and way too good at making projects or tasks and other things much more complicated? I can spend hours getting everything I need to do a project together and run out of energy and never actually start on the project. 
I've got to gather, you know, supplies and tools and leave them out just right and then change it up how I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do and rearrange the slides and do things in the wrong order or then sometimes I have to redo them. You know, a lot of times we do that, especially if we don't read the instructions first. There is an old adage that you should measure twice and cut once, and yet I found in life that I'm much more likely to cut twice after measuring only once. When it comes to faith matters and participation in a church community, people often add complications to make it harder on themselves. In today's gospel, Jesus is trying to help us understand the kingdom of heaven. And the people have tried to make it a lot harder than it needed to be. We don't often go on faith. And oftentimes we mishear what we think Jesus has said to us. This morning, there's a series of parables that are supposed to help our understanding, but if you are not familiar with the various ingredients in these parables, it may confound you even more. For how many of you know what a mustard seed looks like or a mustard tree? Or how big it can actually get? And I know that there are a few cooks out here who know what yeast will do with flour, but if you've never done it, and if you, or if you follow the instructions wrong, you can end up, especially if your yeast has gone flat, with just a pile of flour. <laughs> and yet, if you add the yeast and the warmth correctly, that 60 pounds of flour could become humongous. We have to be able to hear well and listen well to what Jesus tells us and rely a lot on what our heart tells us. Not just our intellect, our reasoning, but what Jesus is telling us. After these parables, he probably continued to get perplexed looks and questions, which probably is one reason he used so many different ways of describing the kingdom of heaven. And at the end, he asked them, do you understand? And they all answered, yes. But if we continue to read through the Gospels, we realize that the disciples oftentimes really don't understand what Jesus has taught them or told them. And they come back with the same questions or they act in ways that go contrary to what Jesus has taught. In each case of these parables, something of great beauty and wonder is inside of something else, ready to be uncovered and allowed to expand or grow. Prayer is like that. It starts with something small inside of us that we allow the Spirit of God to nurture, and then it bursts forth in glory. And we continue to ask questions about what prayer is and how do we pray. Paul's letter to the Romans today, he tries to answer questions about prayer for the early Christians in Rome. He knows that they need to have a strong prayer life in order to understand the kingdom of heaven. Paul reminds them that God is in control and that prayer is not just about us or about what we do. It is the spirit of God at work. The Spirit works in us and with us. It is our weakness, it is in our weakness that the Holy Spirit excels. For the Spirit teaches us and intercedes for us. And at times we do not have the words, may not even be capable of the words, but the Spirit of God works in us and searches our hearts. And prayer is the work of the Spirit. But prayer is also God at work. Paul continues that in everything, God works for God with those who love him. God is working in us, but with us. And no matter what happens here on earth, God can work in it and with us to create good. In the midst of disaster and catastrophe, people often proclaim gloom and doom. 
Some folks are constantly thinking they are experiencing or seeing the signs for the end of the world. They may think that current events even feel like one of the seven deadly plagues that was foretelling the end of the world. Recently, have you heard about that town in Nevada with an invasion of crickets? Hundreds of thousands of crickets constantly chirping, feeding on the dead carcasses of other crickets everywhere you look, crickets. But other people are at the same time experiencing the work of the Spirit. Even amid personal disaster, some people are seeing God at work. Some are finding new creative opportunities. Others are finding new ways to care for their neighbors. I believe it was the football team that was out with shovels, clearing the crickets off of one of the sidewalks so that neighbors could walk down the sidewalk. Some people find new ways of seeing God in action for good. The promise Paul describes in the letter to the Romans is that there is nothing in your life that God can't take and bring a blessing for you or for others. In all things, he says, in all things. Notice the in all things. This isn't a declaration that all things are good. It's all good is a mantra that no one really believes and no one has lived with that really and experienced it anyway. Paul isn't spouting this feel-good statement, but he is standing firm on the belief that even bad, even the bad things that happen, even the brokenness within each of us, even our worst experiences, can lead to something amazing if you are guided by the Spirit. That same Spirit that intercedes for you with sighs too deep for words. Through the centuries, we Christians have continued to see God at work, using us where we are, as we are, to bring about change, to recreate how we do things, or maybe simplify and improve our lives and our world. God even finds ways on occasions to make us humans stop for a while and be still and quiet. We may call those times pandemics or disasters, much as Noah or Jonah or Joseph or you can continue to name many Old Testament characters can attest to. Other times God invigorates us and gives us purpose. We are enabled to make scientific discoveries, to find better ways of doing things, to simplify or improve methods or processes, or simply to share love with those who need it most. With the full tilt, fast paced world of our everyday lives, many people are beginning to intentionally take time for Sabbath again, to realize that they've moved away from their life of prayer to a life of sending up popcorn prayers. Those are those short little requests when you think about praying, Lord, give me strength, Lord, let me get through the grocery line without a long wait, Lord, help me uh, through this traffic like before it turns red, Lord, don't let me be in an accident today. Those are popcorn prayers. They're short little things, often by words or less that we utter all the time, and may not even be aware that we're uttering. But instead, people are starting to set aside time once again to stop and reconnect with our Creator. And when we do so, we realize we have many health benefits, physically and mentally, from just even five or 10 minutes each morning or each night. People are looking for ways to refuel spiritually. And Paul reminds us in today's scriptures that we are, while we are to set aside time specifically to speak with God, prayer is also a way of living. As a, a child and young adult, one of the things that my father always insisted on doing when we went into a restaurant was to, for the whole family to take each other's hands and have a word of prayer before we began to eat. And in some cases, the diners all around us continued talking. Some of them even made jeers about what we were doing. 
But on occasion, we see the people beside us or behind us lay down their silverware and stop for a moment. And on an even rarer occasion, someone would say, thank you for that prayer. I needed that. Prayer is a way of living, of seeing with our heart and not just with our eyes, a way of talking that goes beyond words, a way of being in relationship that God, with God that allows us to understand God working around us and in us and with us. That means that we have to put God in our lives first, praying with all of our being, and God's spirit lives within us. Prayer can transform. Prayer can equip and enable. Prayer can help us to overcome. Prayer can conquer. Too often we get our priorities mixed up and we do things in the wrong order. We put everything else in first, and if we still have any room left, we turn to God and pray. How many of you in maybe a, an elementary school science class, or maybe even in high school, or, or maybe at a vacation Bible school, I saw the, the old thing where you take a jar and you start by putting in something solid like dirt or or, or uh, something else, and then you try to stuff in a bunch of rocks, and you can't get everything in there, and then there's yet water to be poured in. Well, if you start instead with the rocks, and then pour the soil over top of it, and then the water, you can put all of it into that same jar. But you gotta put it in in the right order. And that's what God is telling us and reminding us. Start by putting things in in the right order. We've got to allow God in first. Allow God and then add the important things like family and friends and work and our creative energy and keep adding God into the mix and then also add in the stuff that happens in life that is unexpected, like illness and disappointments. But keep putting God in, and it all fits. God moves in and all around and turns it into something where the Spirit can use it all to make something useful and beautiful and positive for God. So prayer is living, loving, communicating, and nourishing what God gives to us. It is conversation with God. It is a living community with God's people. We don't need to make it super complicated or amass a lot of supplies beforehand. Instead, we may want to allow at first just for some quiet time. We might need to open ourselves to the work of the Spirit and align our hearts to God. We might even want to have a notebook to write down our thoughts the people we want to pray for, the things that are worrying us, and turn them over to God. You might want to just have an everyday conversation with God. This is the secret to the prayer thing that everyone struggles with. Prayer is a time we think, a moment or more in our lives, when we stop and close our eyes and bow our heads. Prayer, we think, is just the words that we say or the posture that we make. Prayer is actually more than just obedience. It is giving God a part of our day. It is part of a routine that we follow, even when we don't feel like it, or we might think we are going to be embarrassed. That's prayer. Of course it is. But prayer is also a necessary part, a vital part of our life. It is something so much more than, than just those moments when we stop. It is more than just those closest moments or those kneeling moments or those tears or laughter moments. A lot, a lot of prayer is just life. It is all of life. Constant prayer doesn't mean mumbling words of prayer all the time like a computer subroutine running underneath everything else we do. It is living in the constant awareness 
of the presence of God. It is knowing that the Spirit is interceding in our lives, even when we've forgotten to how to bow our heads and fold our hands. It is inviting that presence within us, leaning into that presence, longing for that presence, trusting in that presence, even in those when, moments when we don't feel it, because that's when faith kicks in and tells us that even the unseen is real. We need to keep it simple because it is simple. It's something that is also hard to fathom, and yet it's something that God gives to us and helps us grow into understanding. Prayer is being connected to God. The heart leads, the spirit leads, the words follow. And that's what Paul's point is. Prayer is all of these things, and all of these things together, that add the joy and the blessing, Paul says, when the spirit leads with love. Prayer keeps us from being separated from God, and in that depth of our, our, our stresses and challenges, is something that allows us to be more than conquerors through him who loved us. For with prayer, as our scripture this morning says, neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Oh God, hear the prayers of our hearts and of our minds. Let us fill your spirit, feel your spirit stirring within us. Help us to see not with just the sight of our eyes, but your sight, the glory that surrounds us. Encourage us as we realign our lives to live closer to you. Remind us each day of your love and your grace. Use us, O oh Lord, as instruments of your peace and love so that all people may know the beauty and abundance of heaven in this life and in the life to come. Amen. This morning we will affirm our faith using the affirmation of faith on page 888 in the back of your hymnal. We're affirming our faith using the words from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 6, and Colossians 1, 15 through 20. I invite you to stand in body and spirit as we affirm our faith together. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, and then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross, reconciles all things to God. Amen. So that's good news that you're scheduled for that and everything is a go. 
Lord, we'll be praying for you and that everything goes smoothly as you undergo that surgery. Are there other joys or concerns to share this morning? Yes. For um, our friend Ted Barilla, he's going in for surgery tomorrow on his shoulder. So your friend who is going in for surgery tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Have a joy. Lucky and thank you celebrating their 19th, 18th, 18th wedding anniversary. 18th wedding anniversary for you and Lucky. Congratulations. You got home safely from vacation and had a good one, and your cousin is visiting with you, and prayers for your cousin. Okay. We want to pray for Gunter. He had ear infections during the week, and I think that may be why they're not here this morning. Are there other joys or concerns? John? Uh, Bob and Pam Hunter. Bob and Pam. Uh, Debbie. Hey, John, are all in your prayers? Our cousin, the horse is gone. Yes, he's dealing with some lung issues. I missed most of what you said. Hey, John Earl. John Earl. Yeah. Prayers, he's dealing with lung issues again. Health issues? Lung. 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 And Tina. Yes, Evelyn, it's good to see you back, and hopefully you're recuperating from last weekend well. Anyone else? This morning as I lead us in prayer, I'm using the lyrics from hymn number 498 in our hymnal. It's entitled, My Prayer Rises to Heaven, and it is written by Dow Kim. It is based on Psalm 141.2, uh, and it is, um, if you wanted to follow along, it is on page 498. Let us pray. My prayer rises to heaven, to the mystery of God's power. As the smoke ascends when the precious incense burns, have mercy on us, Lord, and grant us your grace. My voice glorifies the Lord God of majesty as the night bird sings at the dawning of the day. This, my offering to God, the Lord of all. As the thirsty earth looks to heaven for life-giving rain to save flower and tree, so I raise my hands high in power. Defend me from all people who try to harm me. O oh Lord God, how I wish that I could live with you for the rest of my life, dwelling in your house, I would feel assured that my prayers would be always in your sight. O oh Lord God, you are love and justice and truth. All your judgments are just. O oh Lord God, you are truth beyond compare. Lord, in you do I trust. My prayer rises to heaven. To the mystery of God's power as the smoke ascends when the precious incense burns. Have mercy on us, Lord, and grant us your grace. My voice glorifies the Lord God of majesty as the night bird sings at the dawning of the day. This my offering to God, the Lord of all. Now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time I would like to call your attention to the screen. I'm going to have Troy start our slideshow from our Vacation Bible School. And while we're watching that, I'd like to ask all of the children who are at Bible School, if you would stand. 
And if their parents would stand and grandparents would stand. And if all of our volunteers who helped out with Bible school would stand. And those who provided food and other supplies that made donations for Bible school, if you would stand. Oh, come on, there are a couple of other people who made donations that aren't standing. John, you were one of them. Come on. Yeah, come on, John. We want to celebrate all of you. Tina was our leader. Chris was our character actor. Let's give them a brief hand of applause. If you would like to come and move up to uh, closer to the, the slideshow, we have some empty pews up here. Feel free to do that. The rest of you may be seated as we watch our slides. Uh, Tina, would you come forward and tell us a little bit? And I think you have a presentation to make too, don't you? I do. So another vacation by the school is in the books. This is one of our. Uh, you want to come up here, man? Want to come here, Nolan? These are two of our um, participants, We've got Nolan and we have Madison. They studied Joseph into Egypt, right? And Joseph was a dreamer. But he also had, he was part of God's plan. And he showed, he, he taught the children the power of forgiveness. Because if anybody needed forgiveness, it was the brothers that threw Joseph in the pit. pit. <laughs> We made dream catchers, we made mobiles. And they made tie-dyed shirts. Is it on? He's getting he's turning it on. Okay. I assumed it was already on. Tie-dyed shirts, of course, was to represent the coat of many colors. Andy was the narrator to the story. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. He was narrated the story, and thanks to Chris, who played a great Joseph. We want to thank all the, the volunteers that made it possible. If it wasn't for John's smocks, we would have been very messy when it came to tie-dye. If it wasn't for those that did the dinner, we would have been very hungry or didn't have any snacks for the children. But most of all, it was the church as a whole, bringing everybody together, bringing you all back today, which was amazing that we had such a big turnout. Um, I can't wait for next year. Um, we already already got someone who wants to come next year, which is which is great. So I do want to um, thank everybody again. You guys were amazing, and um, I can't wait to do this again. And I'm going to give this because Madison wasn't here the last day. This is your certificate for completing it. Thank you. You're very welcome.
I'm going to ask that the slide should continue through while we're having our time of offering this morning. The kids had a great time. The adults had a great time. This church had been praying to have a successful Bible school. And many of us had been praying to increase the numbers that we could have more influence, that we could have more impact on our community and of the children who are coming up behind us to learn to be disciples as we have learned to be disciples. And so... And our prayers were answered, and Tina was a little astounded as we went into the double digits for number of kids this year. It is the largest Bible school we've had in more than six years, and uh, it, is, it takes a whole team. It takes people praying in the background. It takes the donations. It takes the time and the effort and the support of even just getting the word out into the community. So thank you all for all that you've done. Many of you liked the Facebook page and shared it. And so people were talking about, they'd seen it. They'd heard about it from, from different church members that they had come because of an invitation or because they had seen this and wanted to support the program. Prayer works. And we can see that as we think about the ways in which we were community this week and as we had an impact on the world around us. God's kingdom is like treasure hidden in a field. Through today's offering, we can help others find treasure in their lives. Treasure that there is there only through our giving. Come and enter into the mystery of kingdom building and treasure hunting as we collect today's offering. Will our ushers please come?
to bless the gifts that we offer so that they may have a powerful impact when used according to your purposes. Bless us that we might see glimpses of your kingdom through our giving and growing generosity in the process. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of closing this morning is I Am Thine, O Lord, hymn number 419.